his left foot. Never touched his right foot, he's a left foot. Wow, what a player. Gloves on his feet. He's a huge legend of uh, Hungarian football. He was active in, uh, you know, in the harshest communist area. Especially for the genius in culture and in sport, it was extremely difficult. We Hungarians consider him to be the greatest footballer of the 20th century. Ferenc Puskas died at the age of 79 in 2006. Hungary mourned the loss of a national hero. His funeral brought the country to a standstill. A true sign of the affection, Orci, or little brother as he was known back home, was held in the hearts of his compatriots. Emotionally, everybody was touched. Uh, it's obvious that Puskas was considered here in Hungary uh, as the number one son of the nation. He, he was the most widely known person as Hungarian in the world. So in New Zealand or Mexico or, uh, or Scotland, you have said the name Puskas. Uh, you, you know, uh, the story is always the same. I was asked, where are you from? I'm from Hungary. What is Hungary? You know, that's Budapest. Oh, that's Puskas. Yes, yes, that's the home of Puskas. Puskas was actually born Ferenc Purzvelt Biro here in the Budapest suburb of Kispest in 1927. His father, Ferenc Senior, changed the family name to Puskas when his son was 10. Young Ferenc joined the local team, Kispest AC, where his father was a coach. And initially played under the pseudonym Miklos Kovac in order to bypass the minimum age rule of 12. He was a one-off. Even as a child, he could do anything he wanted with the ball. And over the first 10 metres, he was ahead of everybody. And it was with Kishpest where Pushkas shot to prominence. He made his debut for them in 1943. And the following year, the club was renamed Honved after a takeover by the Ministry of Defence. That made it the club of the Hungarian army, in which Pushkas held the rank of major, hence his nickname, the Galloping Major. He helped establish Honved as the country's leading side. And in 1948, he was Europe's top scorer with 50 goals. Such talent convinced Hungary's communist government to use Pushkas as a political tool. Even the harshest communist regime needed legitimacy. It was necessary to testify that this communist dictatorship is equal or even better than the so-called imperialistic Western, uh, you know, capitalism. And Pushkash was a good, uh, you know, raw material <laughs> for the communist regime to say, yeah? The communist regime is uh, able to provide chances and possibilities for that kind of genius. Gustav Shebesh was appointed coach of the Hungarian national team in 1949 and encouraged the side to play what he called socialist football, with every player working hard for the others. Under him, a pushgas inspired Hungary became Olympic football champions in Helsinki in 1952. Jula Grosic was goalkeeper in that side, which beat Yugoslavia 2 0 in the final. I would say that with Ochi as captain, with his know-how and ability, we formed a team that was the best in the world at that time. No doubt about that. Ochi, both as captain and the most talented player, was inspirational. And he played a decisive part in the way the team used to perform to such a high level. Hungary may have been the Olympic champions, but the skeptics poured scorn on their success. Pushkas and co were determined to prove them wrong when they faced England in a friendly at Wembley the following year. The press of the West countries said that it's not a real success because uh, the, the big professional players didn't play at the Olympic Games. That's why the game against England was very, very important. 
The game shook the rest of the world. The visitors produced a breathtaking display to beat the English 6-3. Two goals from Nandor Hideg Kute gave Hungary a 2-1 lead. Then Pushkas produced a moment of genius that's still fondly remembered today. Zoltan Sibor broke free down the right wing and passed to Pushkas. When he received the ball, Billy Wright tried to tackle him. And Ochi produced a back heel that sent Wright sliding past him. The near post was there, unguarded for Ochi to score. Very few players would have been able to execute such a move or even dare to attempt scoring a goal like that. With less than half an hour gone, Pushkas put Hungary 4 1 up. And yet more craft from his left foot almost set up a fifth. Eventually, Josef Bozic made sure with a spectacular effort from distance. It was England's first defeat at Wembley by non-British opposition. Nandor Hidaguti may have scored a hat-trick, but for most observers, Pushkas was the star. We were stunned. Because we saw a style of play, a system of playing that we'd never seen before. And none of these players meant anything to us. We didn't know about Puskas, we did afterwards. <laughs> and all these fantastic players, and they were men from Mars as far as we were concerned. And you know, coming to England, never, England's never been beaten at Wembley. This is a 2-0, 3-0, 4-0, maybe 5-1 de demolition of a small country who had just come into European football. The captain, Frank Puskas, they called him the Galloping Major. He was in the army, so how can this guy be serving for the Hungarian army, come to Wembley and rifle us to defeat? That performance, plus the 7-1 thrashing of England in the return fixture six months later, and a 27-match unbeaten run since May 1950, meant the Hungarians, with Pushkas as captain, went to the 1954 World Cup in Switzerland as favourites. Two goals from Pushkas in a 9-0 victory over North Korea, and one in this 8-3 thrashing of West Germany, helped them top their first-round group. But the latter result was marred by German defender Werner Liebrich after Pushka spoke to Liebrich's Hungarian-speaking teammate, Josef Posipal. Pushkas asked him to interpret for him and to tell Liebrich that he intended to torment him throughout the game. This was more or less the message. He said he'd roll the ball through his legs whenever he wanted and he'd make him look silly. Posipal asked Pushkas not to do that. And so Liebrich took his revenge out in Pushkas. In the second half, a foul by Liebrich saw Pushkas suffer a serious ankle injury, which threatened his participation in the rest of the tournament. He was a key player and, in fact, the main reason behind those world-class results that we'd achieved. And he was forced out for the next two matches. But for Hungary, normal service was resumed even without their inspirational captain. In the quarter-finals, they met Brazil, who'd finished runners-up on home soil four years previously. A 4-2 win sent Hungary through to the semi-finals and their unbeaten record was now 30 games. A week had passed since the injury to Pushkas, but he still showed no signs of improvement as he limped around the training ground. There was no way he'd be ready for the semi-finals against Uruguay. That finished 2-all after 90 minutes and the game went into extra time. Although Hungary eventually won 4-2, they didn't have the best of preparations for the final against West Germany. Those two 15-minute periods of extra time and a little party after the game made us late for our train. We also spent time looking for a restaurant so we could eat something. And, as a result, we arrived back at our hotel between 3 and 4 o'clock on the Friday morning. Lack of rest was not the only problem plaguing the Hungarian team before the final in the Swiss capital, Bern. Feelings were running high as to whether Pushkas should play. 
Apparently, at the last meal in the hotel just before the match, a huge argument had broken out. That was because there were players who preferred Pushkas didn't play. Though it wasn't that they didn't want him to play. They just believed there'd be a 10-man team because they were worried that Ochi wasn't fit enough and that all he wanted to do was to lift the trophy. Pushkas did return as captain for the final, but his presence on the pitch was down solely to his reputation as he was far from fully fit. Germany had fielded an understrength side in their first round group encounter, so a repeat of the 8 3 scoreline was highly improbable. Pushkas may not have been fit, but he justified his selection by scoring the opening goal after just six minutes. And three minutes later, a misunderstanding between German defender Werner Kohlmeier and his goalkeeper Tony Turek handed Zoltan Zibor a gift for Hungary's second. Those who expected another rout were made to think again, though. The Germans hit back immediately, Max Morlock reducing the deficit just two minutes later. Two from Helmut Rahn put the Germans in front with just six minutes left. But Pushkas thought he'd put Hungary back on level terms with just two minutes remaining, only for the linesman to flag him offside. The game was dubbed the miracle of Bern, as West Germany became world champions for the first time. But Hungary's first defeat in 31 games had dramatic repercussions back home. Hungarian football was supported extremely in Hungary by, by the communist leaders. But after this match, uh, I think uh, the football was, was not the favorite thing of the leaders. After the match, thousands of people went onto the streets of Budapest and all over the country to demonstrate. Firstly, because of the defeat, and then soon afterwards to protest against the government at the time. 